Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dark Souls 3, uh, Lore Through. Uh, last time we fought the Dancer, and now we're ready to go on into Lothar Castle. Although, we're not going to go into Lothar Castle proper yet. Um, looks like there should be something here, but it's just a kind of connection with an area up above. And we'll get to that later. Um, that's, that way is towards Lothar Castle, where the kind of game progresses. Now we're going to go to an optional area, and, um, uh, did I, I don't know if I mentioned, this is still a voiceover, um, the previous and the next episode, uh, audio got corrupted, so, no sound, just me, apologize. Um, but yeah. Um, so we're here. Uh, there's a garden down here, although I thought we could see a little bit more than we can. And uh, we can see an area up there that we're going to be in in the next episode. Um, but anyway, here's a cathedral knight here. Um, um, not a Lothric knight, interestingly enough. By the way, I planned this completely log into uh into a backstab totally planned that's not a just just ignore any thoughts you have that I didn't do that on purpose I totally did um so you can get off here at this point uh and I realized that I probably should so just in general, there's a lot of missteps uh, in this in this in this um, episode, particular. So just uh, buckle in for the ride. We probably have a lot to talk about because we certainly aren't going to enjoy like AAA gameplay for sure. Um, so right off on the uh, right off the bat here on the right, we have a Estes shard. Which you know, there's just more and more of these coming. But I guess it's you know you have two Estes shard. Uh, Flask to manage, so it makes sense. There's a lot in this game, and one of many Titanite chunks. That's you know, this is going to be our main way to upgrade uh, to plus ten, which I'm excited about. We already have the slab, so uh, and we haven't really talked about it, but those thing, you know, the the kind of black weird alive thing that's called the pus of man i think the only way that one knows that is from the guide i thought maybe it would come up in an item description but it probably doesn't so i mean it's called the pus of man um in this uh place i try to i think that frost is what i'm getting attacked by um but that's not frost. <laughs> that's toxic. Which I guess makes sense because it's the consumed king, so it's, you know, um, I don't know. He's like corrupted and the things around him became corrupted because he was consumed by something. I don't know. But I spent all this time prepping for frostbite because to me it looks like it should be frost. It looks like frozen. It looks like the frost on the ground. Um, whatever. And of course, I also think that there's something in here. Which there is not. So, um, yeah, we're just trying to clear this area out. And, um, you know, get everything. I, I do have two uh, toxic... <laughs> Or removers to bloomin and I get toxic twice so I guess it's perfect uh, definitely don't want to fight those uh, pus of man we get the shadow gauntlets the claw some black fire bombs and yeah really this is just me running around and just picking up stuff as quick as I can trying to avoid the pus of man affected beings and not knowing exactly where all the items are so I'm just trying to run around and yep yeah. so there we go um, 
and there's a lot of Cathedral Knights here, um, which I could definitely do without. I am not a fan, um, because they, uh, I, I take a few of them out pretty well here. The only thing is that he was able to buff himself, so this kind of sucks here, but, and yeah, he can't, he has no poise break. Like, that wasn't enough for his poise. He's got a lot of poise. Maybe infinite poise. I don't know how these enemies are set up. But you can see he takes damage normally there. Uh, there's that, um, there's that shield. It kind of seems to, uh, to suggest that the king here might be the king spoken about in that shield's description, the old king of Lothric. Because they're out here, and we're going to fight someone who was the king. However, it's possible that there's another theory about that too, and I'm going to entertain both. Um, because the person that we fight here certainly could no longer be a king, considered a king, due to the circumstance. So maybe that's what they mean by the old king. Um, or maybe they mean the king before this king. But at this point, I'm getting ahead of myself because we don't even know who this king that we're looking at is, so um, I'm just trying my darnest to get all the items here um, without completely getting effed up by the Puss of Man and not knowing the area very well. Uh, I am that I'm doing that by just aimlessly running around hoping to find something. Um, but what I do know is that I need to go into this area and do a shortcut, and then that allows me to do the next section quite a bit easier than if I went straight um, up the stairs. So, um, once we get up here, there are deacons from the cathedral, and there are... Um, uh, thralls, which are also in the cathedral. It makes me personally feel like um, the, the Osiris was related to the, the, uh, the cathedral, the deep. Because, like, I don't know. I mean, there's the Lothric Knights, which are solidly in the castle, but the, all the people from the cathedral are here right now. And we know that Aldrich is in on Orlando, so I'm not sure why they're here. Unless, because they have the shield with the king's uh, crest on it, unless they are in service to him in some way. And maybe the Lothric Knights. I don't even want to finish that sentence because it's so wrong. The Lothric Knights definitely are, and there's plenty of proof for that. So anyway, here's the shortcut right at the beginning of the part that we just were at. Um, so we're going to run down here and go to the next section. And as I say, buckle in. Um, I actually don't know what I'm going to talk about because I struggle with the Cathedral Knights and the boss here quite a bit. Um... Unfortunately, I, I, you know, I'm learning the new um, build, and I also kind of felt spoiled from the AR. I was just kind of like, oh, this is going to make the game too easy. I have so much AR, it's going to be whatever. By the way, I don't read that ring for a long time. Apologies. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just like, oh, the AR is great, blah, 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 and all this stuff, and I end up dying a bunch. So I guess I'll take this opportunity to speak very briefly about my opinions on Dark Souls 3. Because, you know, during my time of in Dark Souls 1, where I tried to defeat some areas and I couldn't, I and had to do a voiceover, I ended up talking about Dark Souls 2 and why I was 
kind of critical of those that dismiss it so easily. Um, but so Dark Souls 3, I have to say, like playing through it this time has certainly given me a deeper appreciation for it, both for the combat, which is, I think, so... I mean, I think they attempted to make it very similar to... I just love how he dispatched these guys so easily. Well, not so easily, but so easily compared to what follows in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> Although I almost die there. Um... You know, I, I think there was this kind of maybe assumption on their part to make it as similar as possible to the... To, I also got the magic clutch ring, but I don't think that's... as a magic stone plate. Or maybe the magic... I don't know. Um, but we've read all those before, so it doesn't really matter. Um... And yeah, I don't have enough health. I'll get to this discussion in a second because, you know, there are some events here um, that we should definitely pay attention to. Um, so I decide that I'm going to go back and get Hawkwood um, because, you know, I guess from Dark Souls 2, like summoning people that are part of the story, like, is important to me or whatever. I think it's kind of cool. Um, and it makes me think that, like, Hawkwood left Firelink and then went to this area in order to do something. Um, it's interesting because he definitely has more of a story that we're going to be playing out, and, um, both the story elements that he is involved in involve dragons, so. But, um... So there's kind of a, a thing that happens here. I guess I'll read Osiris's speech because he can't, he can't hear it himself. So this is the consumed king, Osiris, which we've heard about. And it looks like he's not human. In fact, he looks dragon. Ah, you ignorant slaves, finally taken notice, have you? Of the power of my beloved Ocelot, child of dragons. Well, I will not give him up. He's not cradling any real thing. For he is all that I have. I mean, I guess I could turn this sound up for that because I don't talk during that. Um, he talks during the fight as well. Um, so he's uh, carrying a uh, dear little Ocelot because I hit Ocelot or what he was holding. Now there, it's unclear as to whether or not he's carrying an actual, you were born a child of dragons, what could you possibly fear? There's a lot of debate as to whether or not this is actually a thing. Um, there is a unused asset of a child in this game, but um, at the same time, I mean, it seems like a really weird oversight that they don't include, um, you know, just an essential um, asset in a, in a boss fight. Maybe it was that they intended you to like whatever and then the process of you hurting and quote unquote killing the baby didn't pass through you know like ratings or whatever um, so they ended up just removing it and trying to justify it in the lore by saying that you know he like, believes he is a kid, but it's gone, and all this stuff. Um, it's been gone long ago, and he's just crazy. You know, we had similar things in Dark Souls 1 with the undead merchant, and he was petting someone he called Julia, the cat. By the way, notice that he has that white dragon flame breath. 
that curses you, very similar to Seath and I guess Logan. Yeah, and I'm completely out of Estus. And Hawkwood is just standing here, not doing anything. So, I don't know, this was just, uh, this wasn't my, uh, this wasn't my day playing Dark Souls 3. Anyway, back to my general ramblings, because now we've talked about this. Um, ignorant slave so quickly forget. I, quickly you forget. I, I suppose he's probably talking to his subjects in that sense, which is kind of, you know, eh. But he went crazy, I guess. So, um... But anyway, Dark Souls 3, I've certainly enjoyed playing it. I think they intended the combat to be same, the same as 1. It's not. I mean, it, it might feel quick. Like 1, not like 2. But it feels very gel gelatin. You know, it feels very like you can't make a proper sw swing on people. You know, people just kind of bounce back weird. You know, I, I never feel like I make contact. And, you know, the main thing, you know, as part of the, like, I, like, make every wrong decision here possible. Um, you know, the enemies are just, like, they found the things that people use to quote-unquote exploit the game in 1 and 2, and they tried to make enemies that are unexploitable in that same way, which is fine. However, um, the you know, like, parrying is exploiting. However, it's very difficult to learn parrying, and it sort of kind of lives in this world where, you know, if you can master a skill you should deserve to um and by the way it took me a while to realize but i did lose all those souls from the, da the dancer um but i said that i had leveled up like a million times before i i got three hundred thousand souls from farming so i leveled up a lot so i'm not too worried about losing a few souls but, you know, it's like, to make something unexploitable, it really changes the feeling of the game in terms of gameplay. You know, when when um, enemies have two different moves that start out the exact same way, and you perceptively don't have enough time to react to one, and the other one is timed perfectly, that if you reacted as soon as you possibly could, it would catch you on the on the next one it just leads to being frustrating not being fun like not like you can't master it in that sense and you know maybe it's just a whole nother level level of mastery and there are people that are listening to what I'm saying and they just like well you know um no I figured it out I get it every time there's never I can I can parry every move and that's given to me, and I have no problems. And if that's the case, that's um, then I'm wrong, and I and I should probably play it more. However, like the types of challenges that I, um, you know, faced in Dark Souls two and th and one that I got good at and overcame and made the game trivial in some ways because I was able to master some techniques is very fun to me, you know? Like, I love, like, gameplay. Gameplay is probably the strongest element of a game for me. Um, you know, for example, if this game was really hard to play, I mean, I'm just talking to any game in the series, right? Like, like if this had no gameplay, but it had great lore, which I'm obviously both interested in, and great, like, enemy design and all that stuff, I don't know that I'd be... I, I don't know that I'd care about it. Like, th the gameplay makes me put enough time into it to care about all the other things. So, to me, you know... I mean, I'm glad this wasn't the first one, although 
I mean, if this was the first one, I guess it would still be so different than anything else that, you know, maybe it would be a similar deal. But, you know, I, you know, I think that um, the types of gameplay of 1 and 2, and I know a lot of people don't like 2's gameplay because they think it's, you know, whatever. But to me... It's as predictable as one, but it feels very different than one. And objectively, I can say, as someone who learned on two and then went to one, I think they're very equatable. And anyone that played one and then got, like, unused to it and then, like, had a hard time adapting to it, I think it's unfair to to objectively criticize two for having bad gameplay. In fact, I think it has great gameplay because it is so slow so it 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 works well within the human reaction time and you don't get into that intuitive rhythm uh, that you can sometimes get into with one um, and often in three <laughs> um, there are lots of sections of three where I feel like I get into an intuitive rhythm and I love it and it's great so that's awesome I mean if it wasn't like that I probably would not even, I would just be like, this is a terrible game and I don't want to play it. Um, but there's these enemies here, you know, the that have the delayed attacks that look the same. You know, the weird poise that, you know, like just was absent from the game and didn't actually function in any meaningful way so that you were just like stuck with like, I don't know, weird things. Um, weird interpretations of poise. You know, I always said this game's about positioning and all that stuff. Um, so maybe, you know, looking at it purely from that standpoint, like, I, it, it, it's fundamentally a different way to play the game. And maybe I'm not good at that. I'm just rambling now and repeating myself. But I'm just saying that um, from what I love about Dark Souls 1 and 2 in terms of gameplay, Three lacks for me. I don't like how the combat feels, and I don't like the delayed attacks on the bosses and the a lot of these kind of like super enemies, of which there are way more than like Dark Souls 1 or 2. Like if you were to equate like these Cathedral Knights to the Black Knights, I mean how many just of the Cathedral Knights are of there, let alone actual Black Knights, let alone Lothric Knights, let alone I mean, I think Lothric Knights are similar to Balder Knights, but, like, they're almost like Balder Knights if they were... They're almost like the Bernanke Knights. Anyway. Um, so, gameplay-wise, I am, you know, the least satisfied with 3, and that's probably why I say that it's my least favorite. When it comes to lore, it's it's close to one of my favorites. You know, when it comes to lore, I think, you know, Dark Souls 1 has, you know, like this tight-knit story. But it it's kind of all over the place. I mean, there are some things that are not talked about. There are some things that are so convoluted it doesn't make any sense. Um... Like, and it's not super consistent, you know, it doesn't feel like whatever. Um, and Dark Souls 2 is none of that. I mean, Dark Souls 2 is a tapestry, um, you know, and we've talked about this a lot in my Dark Souls 2 playthrough. So um, if you want to know exactly how I feel about the lore in, in uh, Dark Souls 2, feel free to watch that series. I mean, I know it's a lot to get my opinion, but it's a, it's a nuanced opinion because on one hand, uh, there's some problems with it and it doesn't have the same atmosphere as one. And it's kind of like just a bunch of little stories and little places and little things woven into a tapestry of a big world. But at the same time, there is a hidden story in that. There is a lot of good connections to Dark Souls 1, and it, putting it in context, you start to put together that tapestry into something a little bit more meaningful than just a tapestry. So that's my short of it. Um, but Dark Souls 3, like, the story about Aldrich and Pawn of Sullivan 
and you know the profane flame and how that relates to certain offshoots like Yorm and the and the Abyss Watchers and 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 then obviously all the stuff that's happening with Lothric, which we've we've only touched on. We only know there's a Queen of Lothric and we only know there's this Osiris, but we don't know much about Ocelot or other children or other stories. I mean we've just barely started to learn about the culture of Lothric with the three pillars and all that stuff. So it gets it gets good. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff coming, and you know for that stuff there's a lot of good stuff. I mean it almost functions like Bloodborne in that way. Like Bloodborne is probably the tightest of all, um, which is probably why I'll just say Bloodborne's my favorite game. It's got I think the best gameplay. I think it's got it's very short, unfortunately, but that could be its advantage at some points. Um, uh, and it has the, I think, the most consistent lore. I think it has a good story, and I think it tells its that story in the best, like, Miyazaki way possible. Which makes sense. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of this thing, like, I'm obsessed with creation um, of things. You know, if I watch a film, I'm fascinated by how, how the director made decisions, how the screenwriter, uh, you know, wrote it, how the actors decided what to do rather than the effect sometimes. So my obsession with Miyazaki and the process of which these games were made is definitely important to me. So let's lay it out. We have plenty of time. I continually die and die and die. Um, so he made Demon Souls, you know, and I, I don't know if he, I don't know his status in front in the company at that point, but I mean I know he was kind of given that project, e even maybe when it was partially completed, and um, he kind of infused a lot of things into Demon Souls, and you know it is amazing because Demon Souls, although I think is definitely an unpolished version of Dark Souls, and for that reason I have difficulty kind of getting through some sections of it. Um, hence why I've never beaten it, um, although I should give it a good shot, uh, I no longer have a PS3 though, so maybe, here's hoping for a remastered, um, but, like, a lot of the concepts, even concepts that, like, were abandoned and then brought back into Dark Souls 3 are completely innovative, really, um, even if they got more polished in the later games, it really goes to show that, like, you know, like a concept, I mean, it, I guess it just shows that a concept needs to be polished in order to be really supported because it's it's a bit rough there, um, and if it were more polished, it probably would have been more universally recognized as genius. Um, but it took, you know, four or five games to get to that point where people are like, undoubtedly, the things that happened in Demon Souls were genius. And it was a sleeper hit, you know, no one, no one in Japan really got into it, or it just wasn't, like, a hit. And he looked like he was going to be... By the way, this is like a cobbled together story of things I've heard. If this is not exactly how it happened, I mean, please let me know. Uh, slash, you know, don't crucify me. Um, these are just things I've heard online. I've never, like, I mean, Miyazaki doesn't give interviews, and I don't know the exact, you know, details of From and all this stuff, but... All of a sudden, after much after it's released, uh, Demon Souls kind of became popular in America as like a sleeper hit, and you know there was kind of a small dedicated following of people, and uh, it also came along around a, a very kind of formative time on YouTube, um, where people were definitely, you know, starting to make videos about games and stuff like that. I mean, there was a lot of that, but like you know, once. Dark Souls came out. I mean, people were pouring over that game because they were like, okay, Demon Souls was so awesome. Uh, From gave Miyazaki some more control. He's like, okay, here, you have your whole game from start to finish. I mean, they didn't always have all the budget and all the time they needed, but I mean, they're like, here, do it. So what he had with Demon Souls, he kind of, he's like, okay, let's do this for real. Instead of like a beta, let's do like a proper version of this game and more like consistent with stuff and whatever. And, you know, some things are very like, 
similar, but in a, in a sense, he did a real good job also of giving its own universe that is very separate from that of, you know, um, Demon Souls. But, uh, you know, then the YouTube community really got into it. And, you know, I can think very quickly here, you know, like uh, Epic Name Bro was kind of a huge progenitor of Dark Souls lore and videos and really saying, like, there's more to this and, you know, analyzing it and doing all this stuff. And that obviously became a super hit. That became a super hit in Japan. That became a super hit in um, uh, in the U.S., all over the world. And it was at that point where Miyazaki was like, okay, I've done this game. I, you know, I'm okay with... Um, you know, I mean, in a sense, he remade Demon Souls, but I mean, it really was like a um, a more cohesive, like it's a proper game, I guess. Maybe that's the way he can consider it, and it's like I'm happy with this. So then, when it's like you can do whatever you want, you know, because you 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 basically made a new generation of this uh, um, company. He's like, okay, I'm going to do Bloodborne. I'm going to do a new thing. Like, I'm, If we're going to give me real power and real money to do stuff, I'm, I'm going to do another story. But, you know, like, pressures that be. I mean, there's a business person running that company. And, you know, even the most avant-garde artists have always, like, speckled their works with, you know, pop... <laughs> in a sense to you know they, they you gotta you gotta sell it somehow if for for a more general audience and so the business person involved with that was like well we're gonna make dark souls 2 and we'll use it with our b team you know and they made dark souls 2 and we've talked about the life cycle of that and how i think that was at least saved from a very disastrous fate even if people are still very critical of it I would be very interested to see how people would think about it if it wasn't, like, saved, and they would begin to appreciate all the decisions that um, Tana, um, Tanamura made. I'm, I apologize if that's not his name. And then, you know, they were like, okay, Bloodborne also did great, blah, blah, blah. Not as great as Dark Souls because it was only released on PlayStation, like Demon Souls. But it was great, um, you know, and so they were like, all right, well, we're going to make a Dark Souls 3 because Dark Souls 2 did really well. Everyone who missed out on Dark Souls jumped in on Dark Souls 2. And then um, Miyazaki's like, all right, well, if you're going to do a third one, I got to be involved with it. I can't, like, we can't do this again. You know, we're going to have to get it whatever and I feel like there's a little bit of uh, you know I don't know how to say it or even say it politely if that's you know an issue but like that there is kind of you know an attempt by Miyazaki to you know not lose control over this too much and make it something that's going to be terrible but at the same time I don't think that he was passionate about what this uh, series is about anymore and like although as I say it's still like very well put together like if this were any other game any other series it would be like amazing the amount of depth that went into all this stuff so don't get me wrong but you know there there is some feeling that I have in there that it's inconsistent and it's you know it's somewhat you know it's got a bigger budget it's got a, a thing it's got a, you know it it doesn't feel unpolished and and cobbled together and like lazy but it just doesn't feel like it could have been as unified in all aspects as you know, even Bloodborne or Dark Souls 1 was. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> that was just a bit of a ramble. Um, but that's my kind of short, uh, or my long <laughs> thoughts on, you know, the issues with Dark Souls 3, 
how it relates to the other games, and why I can't objectively like claim any given thing about these games based on the fact that I'm obsessed with how they were created, and that I appreciate that, you know, like, you know, I don't, I don't blame, like, producers and distributors uh, of video games for altering the the artistic vision of anything because you know everything is goes through that like every movie and every album that like is like a hit because it's new still goes through that process like there is a good way to like you know edit edit through things in order for them to sell and and for them to be better. Um, however, I just that was very close. <laughs> if any of you are actually watching this and not just listening to me, that was like that. I do beat him on this time, so uh, that was very lucky that I survived there. Anyway. Um, so I understand what needs to happen, blah, 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 blah. I'm excited about Dark Souls Remastered. I'm excited about everything. It's really great. But I am excited about new IPs, uh, especially the ones by Miyazaki, you know. Uh, I mean, I guess we'll see, you know. Uh, to me, he's like a win-win with D Dark Souls and then Bloodborne. I'm, you know, going to kind of ignore the other projects, and I'm really excited to see what he can do with, you know, more control and more and over a new IP. Um, so, anyway. Uh, so let's read The Soul of Osiris, the Consumed King. Osiris went mad trying to harness his royal blood for a greater purpose, leading him to the heretics of the Grand Archives, where he discovered the twisted worship of Seath the Pale Drake. It is my belief that Osiris was a human, and that he um, found he, he started investing in the Grand Archives for his own personal benefit, and attempted to do things that changed him into a dragon via the path of the dragon, uh, the way of the dragon, um, and through dragon scales, and through all that stuff. We'll learn a little bit more about that, but I mean, it it makes a lot of sense that, like, dragons are part of Lothric. They tame the dragons. He became obsessed with dragons. He became a dragon himself. His child that he bore, he calls born of child of dragons. There's these uh, serpents on the floor here. Um, it's interesting because the only other time you see these enemies is uh, at Arch Dragon Peak with dragons, where the dragons kind of reside in this world. So, um, coincidence? <laughs> Obviously not. I was kind of wondering about these tablets here scrawled on. Uh, they look like they could be tombstones, and yet. The scrawling on them doesn't look like any tombstone writing. So, yeah, he found Seath's info. He obviously has white dragon breath, so he's read a lot about them. And then behind the king, we now find the kind of lord vessel thing we saw in the beginning of the game. And on this Lothric Knight, a path of the dragon emote or gesture. Um... And so it's interesting because this kind of, you know, there's a Lothric knight doing the path, the way of the dragon, or the path of the dragon emote. It seems like he would have trained the Lothric knights to be part of the way of the dragon. That's why they tamed the dragons, and they did all that stuff. It also makes sense why we saw a bunch of Lothric knights sitting by that dragon, in uh, Irithyll Dungeon, looking at Archdragon Peak, as if they had some business there. There's some other connections with that, too, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get into. But for now, I think it's suffice it to say that uh, it's interesting that Osiris became so consumed with dragons that he became a dragon. We also know that... Um, um, Queen... The Queen of Lothric left 
his side after the birth of her son, presumably Ocelot. And, uh, and we kind of learn where she headed in an item description here. Uh, I, by the way, I think I like I have a whole bunch of uh, uh, items that we haven't read, and I get a whole bunch of new items here, and we just kind of collect everything, go through this area, struggle a little bit, <laughs> all the same, and and then we read them all later, which will be good because we can expound on them then. So we can see some Corvians here in the untended graves. Um, behind uh, Lothar Castle. Um, not sure why they're here, but they are. And I want to talk a little bit about what this place is in a second. Because I think I do read this one right now. Gray crystalline ri ring crafted from shards. Once a treasure brought before Lothric's queen, she had it enshrined in the cemetery of untended graves so that one day an unkindled might profit from its use. So that's really interesting. Queen, Loth queen of Lothric brought it here. Yeah, she probably did the Ash Ashenestus flask too. We'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, now we can see that, um, like that, um, Lord Vessel type thing from the beginning, and this is the path in the beginning. This is the beginning of the game. However, um, it is uh, different. For one, it's dark. There's different enemies here. Um, it's not the one that we visited in the beginning of the game. I guess that's all I'll say right now. And there's a lot of ways to look at that, and uh, we'll talk about that probably in the next episode. Or, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, and also, I hate dogs. I hate dogs in this game. I always hate dogs in this game. I'll never not hate dogs in this game. Dark Souls 1, 2, 3, I hate dogs. Um, but we don't have enough information to formulate a full theory on what we're seeing and why um, and why we're uh, in the graveyard that we basically rezzed up from in the beginning of the game and and what's going on here. <laughs> um, I like that it's a nice touch that there are grave wardens in here. You know, because this is a grave. that They are meant to be tending the grave around the Cathedral of the Deep. I have that move too, by the way. I can spin too, is what I'm saying here. Um, but, um, but they place them here quite appropriately because they uh, they belong here, tending the graves. Oh, I don't know if I die another time here. I can't remember. Or if I can actually get to the boss. But, um, yeah, it certainly is mysterious that, uh, like, there's essentially a parallel... I, I, I will go to read that, and then I realize we have so much to read that we're just all going to read it at once. Um, it's interesting that there is a parallel to a certain area. I, I don't know if this gets into the realm of being a little bit too convoluted, because it's certainly not come entirely clear what's going on. But during the playthrough of this, I definitely figured out something that I'm happy with. Um, but yeah, I see two large crystal lizards here, and I'm like, okay, bye. There's also an invader here. I'm not uh, embered, so maybe we'll do that as an extra thing later, but uh, 
considering, you know, just the fact that I've been losing over and over again, and, like, I'm trying to get through the story and do all that stuff, I'm not interested in dying to a bunch of crystal lizards over and over again. So I decided to just do the run for the boss. Uh, I think I only play the boss twice, maybe three times, can't recall, but um, I used to play uh, this boss over and over and over again, like I um, I got really good at this boss, uh, and you know, I, uh, I'm not great at it, and I do summon people uh, to help me, but I... Uh, but I don't know, being only twice, you know, I say only twice, but of course I summon, so. By the way, we find a hidden blessing there. Um, that's our first one we found in the wild. And I think now, with kind of everything we've been putting together, uh, I think the description of that will probably be a little bit more, I can read a lot more from that now. Or maybe it's another item I can't remember. Um... But, um, yeah. Just struggling through these, uh, you know, very basic enemies. We get a couple cleric sacred chimes, which is good, because we're going to use those in the next episode to kind of get something. Um... So, yeah, I guess I'm just deciding. So one of the people that you can summon here is the Sword Master, the Old Master. Um, and I grab Doc Walrus, because, I mean, why wouldn't you summon a guy called Doc Walrus? But, uh, Sword Master, uh, I don't think he's the best at this fight, but, um, you know, he, he uh... He's an NPC, like he's a story character-ish, so I feel like I have to summon him, even though he's terrible. But anyway, this should be Gundir, right? Because that's who we fought um, when we uh, when we came through here in the original game. There's Doc Walrus. Awesome. Um, but this time, we fight Gundir again. Um, this time, he's not affected by the Puss of Man, which is a lore point we got to consider. He also doesn't have a... Uh, he doesn't have a coiled sword stuck into his body. Um, which maybe we can put together as we go along here. So yeah, I'm just trying to struggle with my build for this, and I, you know, I end up kind of focusing on. Oh, he got Doc Walrus. Don't die, Doc Walrus. Oh yeah, this is how I die. I just end up going so close to the edge here, and you know, I feel confident in trying to hit him off on in this thing, and then he just like whacks me. Like, I don't know. Come on. You can't get mad at me for that one. I guess you probably can be mad at me for summoning people for every boss, but, you know, this isn't meant to be a uh, uh, a demonstration of playability. This is just me trying to get through the story. Um, and, I don't know. I would imagine that I've probably demonstrated on more than one occasion of some sort of ability playing this game even if it doesn't kind of come close to some of the people that put thousands of hours of it, thousands of hours into this game so um anyway I'm not trying to make an excuse I'm just you know um so yeah um this guy is called champion gundir instead of Udix gundir 
And uh, Eudix, you know, we talked about earlier, is Latin or, I don't know, it feels like it could be Hebrew or something. But it's, you know, it's an older language, um, probably Latin, for judge. You know, and it, Udex, like G-U-D, like it's very close. I mean, the X at the end makes me feel like it's... Uh, uh, Latin, because that, I think, is a declension for something. Um, but, anyway, <laughs> Latin uh, lessons aside, um, so Udix means Judge Gundir, and then we have Champion Gundir, which obviously means Champion. Um, so... There's a couple of things that we get that indicate that this is, like, that we are now here. Like, all of the game that we've played, besides Firelink Shrine, has been in the past. Like, we get a lot of indications of that. And I'll, and I'll go through a lot more of that, but... Um, did I not summon anyone else? Maybe I do do three... Um, three runs at this, because I'm pretty sure I have a, another person. Um, but yeah, I at least try to get into my parrying techniques, which is basically how I defeated this guy, because, you know, I don't play blocking with a shield and all that stuff. I, uh, I gotta roll and parry and all that stuff, so I try my best to to figure it out, but yeah, I must die here. Um, so... If this is in the past, I mean, so this would be before the, the gun deer that we fought, which I guess, you know, if he's been sitting there for a long time, potentially, you know, it would make sense that he, A, was infected by the pus of man, and two, was like... Um, n not as powerful as he is here. Like, this is presumably him at his near prime. And, uh, you know, Eudix Kandir, he's just only there to, like, I don't know. Like, he's got, he's been impaled with a coiled sword. I at least get one parry off this guy. I get a few more, I think, but not here. And I still forget the timing of that one. He gets me in his... Yeah, he gets me in his combo. Didn't dodge it in time. Um, but yeah, so... I'm just trying to think of something to talk about before we actually see any evidence of all the things that I'm claiming right now and all the other details of of that type of thing. Um, but all we have is this, uh, what we're seeing right now. So, I mean, I guess, you know, the Queen of Lothric left after her child was born, as we've talked about a couple times, including a moment ago. But, you know, we don't know why that is. And, you know, it seems like, you know, based on the Ashenus this ring, that she, you know, she placed it there for Ash, uh, which I think is the most telling thing of this whole thing, that, you know, perhaps this whole storyline... Um, including, like, what happens in, essentially, the future, like, in the Firelink from our timeline, you know, that all comes to be due to uh, what happened with Queen Lothric, and probably, you know, I mean, this might be getting ahead of myself a little bit too, but, like, if, if Osiris is obsessed with dragons and Queen of Lothric is uh, 
I was almost going to say something bad there, but um, mixing up my names here. I don't want to mention any characters we haven't met yet. But if she's Guinevere, as I believe she is, um, I mean, just because Divine Blessing says that, you know, she's the, she previously was the goddess of fertility and bounty, and we know that the goddess of bounty and fertility is, you know, Guinevere. Um, like, but the dancer could be Guinevere. I mean, I guess we'll see that more specifically next episode, but I believe Queen of Lothric is. And uh, so if she is that, it would make sense that, you know, she probably gets a little bit nervous up from her husband, Osiris. At least the second husband she had, by the way. She used to be married to Flame God Flan, who I wish we knew more about. Maybe he's Osiris, and he has a different name as well. Um, but, um, her family, I mean, you know, based on what her dad went through, I mean, whether you think Gwyn is a hero or not a hero, I mean, he certainly, like, has his own, like, perspective of the world, of which Guinevere, who is adored by her father, would have been raised to believe, and that would be piece of cake. What's the big deal about Champion Gundir? Anyway, um, it would be that Gwyn hated the dragons. I mean, Gwyn fought the dragons for years. I mean, we know that generations fought the dragons. Um, and, uh, and so it would make sense that she might be a little bit weirded out by Osiris for being so involved with the dragons and taming the dragons and all that stuff, and that's probably why she left. All right, we're going to call it here at this point before we get into any more deep lore, and, uh, we'll start back, uh, in the same place in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Bye.